Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. You have a real treat in store for you today. We have one of my favorite plant-based doctors. He's actually a cardiologist in Houston, Texas. He's been on the show before. We've got lots of questions that have been sent in, as always is the case when we have a spectacular doctor here. And today, he is going to be talking about some really interesting things when it comes to medicine. And I would love to introduce my friend, Dr. Baxter Montgomery. It's nice to see you. Likewise, Chef AJ, thanks for having me. And it's always a pleasure to be on your show. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, with your audience. Uh, I always get a lot of interesting questions and, and a lot of challenging questions. So I look forward to the day. Yeah. Well, I think blue's your color, especially that shade, I might add. That is a beautiful, beautiful scrub top. You know, you're going to talk about nutrition as a key component to integrative care medicine. And, and so maybe talk a little bit about what integrative care medicine is, because you are an MD. Yes, thanks. And, uh, you know, thanks for the question. You know, the issue of integrative care medicine has been part of what we've done in my practice for some time. However, in the last two years, uh, and actually been on the last two years, become more noticeable in the last two years, you know, as a society, we've had major health challenges. And on the one hand, you have individuals with uh, advanced health issues, uh, someone who may have diabetes or heart disease or the like, uh, and, and they're on, you know, lots of advanced therapies, medication, they've received surgeries. And the key to their overall improvement is really an improved lifestyle. However, if someone has, you know, advanced heart disease or advanced diabetes or, you know, advanced arthritis and, and they're, you know, requiring lots of medications, it's often hard for them to do the lifestyle things that we tend to promote, eat healthy, exercise, sleep better. They may be taking medication that impair their sleep, but they, they're, they're so short of breath or their arthritis is so bad they can't exercise uh, and on and on. And so individuals in this situation who come to see a doctor like myself, uh, who's managing their advanced you know, illnesses using allopathic treatments also have to integrate that therapy with lifestyle. Uh, individuals who are, are in conditions such as advanced heart disease or diabetes, they're the individuals who really need an underlying lifestyle change. However, it's very difficult for them to do that on their own. Uh, oftentimes in a hospital and, and so on and so forth. So what we've developed over the last, you know, two, two and a half, three years is an integrative care model where we take advanced lifestyle interventions and integrate them in the care of these patients with advanced uh, heart disease or advanced diabetes or the like. Uh, so uh, it's been more prevalent to me in the last year too with the, the global health challenges that we've had uh, that we've noticed that we are in a health crisis. Uh, life expectancy, which began on a slow decline from 2014 to 2019, began to take a nosedive in 2019 to 2020, uh, 2021. Um, we've had a precipitous increase in the number of deaths in individuals uh, ages 18 to 64 from the year 2021 uh, compared to year 2020. Uh, and it seems to be only increasing in the year 2022. So we are truly in a health crisis. Uh, medications, surgeries, chronic illnesses become the norm for children and adults. Uh, and so we need to start doing things not only uh, in an in a advanced way for more medical therapies, more surgeries, but we need to start to be more aggressive with integrating the lifestyle. So what are we doing at Montgomery Heart and Wellness? Well, we've put together a number of programs where individuals come to our center and they are on advanced therapies such as medication, et cetera. We put them on a nutritional plan. We put them on an exercise plan. There are other alternative interventions such as uh, sauna therapy. We do micronutrient supplementation in a targeted fashion. So we will look at individuals, not only from the clinical standpoint in terms of, okay, what is your blood pressure? What is your ejection fraction? What is your hemoglobin A1C? But we also take this data and we also integrate aggressive lifestyle uh, intervention and help them reverse their illness. So what does that look like? Our most recent uh, advanced intervention, we call it heart and soul of a champion. 
Uh, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that intervention um, and uh, because there are two components to it. There's a, there's, a, there's a documentary that we'll talk about a little later. But Heart and Soul of a Champion is our most aggressive intervention, uh, uh, integrative therapy. And in that situation, we've had individuals come with advanced illnesses. For example, one individual with congestive heart failure came and we started them on a nutritional detox regimen, raw plant-based diet with time-restricted eating. Uh, he was uh, getting sauna therapy, which has uh, 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 scientific validation, improving uh, congestive heart failure symptoms and overall well-being and outcomes. Uh, we followed him to the point where we were able to wean him off all of his medications by nine or 10 days. We were able to then get him into the gym and started working out with him. So while he was on nutritional detox, we were able to wean his medications, getting sauna therapy on the close medical observation, exercise therapy, started to further improve his overall well being. Uh, other intervention uh, inter individuals with malignant hypertension came into our center. Uh, with blood pressure 191 over 114, with an immediate nutritional detox regimen, was able to get the blood pressure down, uh, eliminate the need for rushing them to the hospital. But we're following these patients every day in our center. We get them out exercising once we're, they're clinically stable uh, and their condition is improving. So there's a precise nutrition intervention, precise nutrition prescription. There's a precise exercise prescription with trainers, uh, we also have other therapists, massage therapists, and chiropractors as needed for musculoskeletal issues that come up. So we have really brought in these modalities in our center. We do advanced allopathic care. We have someone has to go to the hospital. We can care for them there, but we also bring them out into our center and manage their advanced illnesses uh, medically, but also wean them off of these therapies and get them into an advanced uh, uh, lifestyle uh, approach. And we've had good success. Yeah, you know, you're one of the few doctors that really emphasize the raw food aspect of nutritional healing. M many doctors, you know, promote whole food plant-based, you know, without oil, sugar, salt, but you you really focus on raw. And I'm curious, is that better for healing the vasculature? Yes, it is. Um, so with the raw plant-based diet, we know from our clinical experience, there's also some limited evidence. It's not a, there are not a lot of studies that do head-to-head -head raw uh, diets and, and cooked diets. Uh, there's a Dr. Jenkins uh, we've uh, came across in our literature that showed uh, a, a significant improvement in, in benefits and certainly biomarkers in a short period of time uh, using a raw diet. Um, back in the 1830s, uh, uh, I think Dr. Karatkov, I'm mispronouncing the name, I'm almost certain, showed that cooked food increased uh, inflammation when consumed by just measuring white blood count. And there's some other limited data that supports this. And our, our clinical experience is that our patients on a raw diet uh, uh, detox faster. Also, individuals with advanced systemic illnesses, such as you know, heart disease, heart failure, or systemic inflammatory conditions, when we start them on a raw diet and then we allow them to have uh, cooked foods in their nutrition regimen after a while, uh, they start to regress. And so that's just our clinical experience. Um, uh, biochemically, if you look at raw plant foods, uh, you're dealing with the whole foods and, and it depends on how you cook the foods uh, could determine you know, uh, how beneficial or harmful the foods are. We certainly know that frying foods, one form of cooking is not ideal. But there are other forms of cooking which may be less ideal as well. Uh, high heat uh, uh, oven baking or grilling, uh, carbohydrates that you know, may be something like toast with uh, you know that has browning, a can form acrylamide. So there are lots of evidence that 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 strongly uh, suggests that certain forms of cooking can be uh, harmful. And in our clinical experience, with individuals who are advanced disease, uh, the cooked foods to a certain amount. Um, uh, can um, blunt their progress and in some cases cause regression after they've been on a completely raw diet. I think after a while when someone's health is, is, is stabilized, they're in a good condition, they can consume a mixture of raw and cooked foods um, with uh, I think the majority of that being you know live raw foods. Yeah, because you, you have a classification system. That's correct. Yeah. And, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the, the classification system 
uh, in my opinion, at least in our attempt, uh, gives some level of precision. Because even if I said, okay, raw foods, well, what does that mean? Because, you know, certain people say, okay, I use, do a lot of dehydration of foods. So if I'm eating a lot of raw foods that dehydrated, then is that healthier than something that's cooked that's lightly steamed? Well, some that's cooked that's lightly steamed may have more hydration than something that's heavily dehydrated. And so you may have a disadvantage between the raw food and the cooked food. So that's why a numbering system gives uh, some level of precision as opposed to this blanket labels. So uh, the classification system is on a zero to 10 level. It classifies food uh, theoretically at every health level. So zero is the healthiest and 10 is the least healthy. Uh, we try to get people to stay within zero to six uh, long term. That's in the plant based uh, uh, realm. So, for example, zero will be raw foods that are liquefied, that are smoothie, then juice. I'll explain uh, the reason for that in a minute. One, two, and three are solid raw foods. So, like you have uh, a level one food is a raw solid plant food that has low glycemic index. A level three is a raw solid plant food that's high glycemic index. And a level two is an immediate glycemic index raw plant food. Level four gets the transition. So 4A uh, is high fat raw food. So you have seeds and, and uh, say avocados. Nuts, uh, raw nuts I put in level six because some nuts are heat shelled and it's hard to know which are which. But theoretically raw nuts should be a 4A, but, but some raw nuts, cashews is a good example, are often heat uh, steam shelled or heat shelled. So you don't know how much heat is getting into the nut. So I put them in a level six. Um, 4B is dehydrated raw food. So then the moisture is taken out of uh, foods. 4C would be lightly cooked foods or heated uh, foods, uh, maybe blanched. Five and six are boiled and steamed at different time durations. Uh, and so that's what you have, uh, the levels. Now, once you get to seven, eight, nine, uh, let's say, for instance, you can have vegan food that's seven, eight, or nine. So like you can get the okra that's battered and deep fried. Uh, it's uh, in our classification, it would be a nine. Uh, and so you can have heavily grilled uh, vegetables with oil. It's going to be a nine or 10. So plant foods that are quote unquote vegan can be uh, in the uh, zone that's harmful. And so using our classification system uh, enables us to help our patients differentiate uh, how to prepare the foods. And as opposed to saying, okay, go eat raw, go eat raw vegan, go eat vegan. Uh, now, commentary on our level zero, oftentimes individuals say, well, you know, I hear on one side of the aisle, you know, people say no smoothies and no juices and so on and so forth. You know, if you juice an apple, you know, you're getting the high sugar and blah, blah, blah. And, and I understand that. Here's, here's the, the take on that. Uh, and, and again, our clinical experience supported. Uh, number one, uh, it is my, uh, my feeling, feeling or thinking, uh, understanding that it's going to be ideally in the ideal situation for you to be able to chew your food whole, grind it up and swallow it, you know, in the raw state. So ideally level one should be the best, the number one level. The reason I gave level zero a higher level is because there are individuals that we see frequently who are so ill that they can't chew their food uh, due to poor dentition or due to the fact that they're in the hospital in the ventilator or something like that. And so a raw uh, smoothie, a uh, cold pressed juice food allows to give super nutrients in the, into the system uh, without chewing. The other thing, many individuals have gastrointestinal problems, be it due to inflammation, be it due to prior surgeries, et cetera, and they don't absorb the food very well. Uh, cold pressed juices, smoothies allow absorption of nutrients in, in that situation. And then lastly, my patient with congestive heart failure or anybody with an advanced metabolic compromised state uh, where the energy expenditure is, is, is you know, compromised, uh, it allows them to be nourished without expending energy of breaking down food and absorbing nutrients. So due to malabsorption uh, situations uh, or poor energy state, heart failure being an example, or poor dentition or GI you know, uh, conditions that preclude adequate absorption, smoothie and juice foods are ideal uh, in this situation. And I will also say that there, there are no studies showing the adverse effects of cold pressed juice, such as juice feasts or smoothies 
uh, being problematic in terms of head-to-head -head studies. And, and, and so I just want to state that uh, we do know if you're consuming high fructose corn syrup processed juices, there can be problems with that. I don't think a cold press juice is the same thing as a high fructose corn syrup processed ju juice. However, you know, we need to do more studies showing that. I can say that we have a long clinical experience showing the benefit of using foods formed in this situation, uh, uh, helping individuals reverse uh, chronic illnesses and being a benefit. You know, I don't know if people realize, I, if there are other cardiologists that do this, I'm not aware of them, but I visited your office and it's not just a doctor's office, it's a gym, it's a restaurant. <laughs> do people have to go to Houston to be treated by you? So that's a great question. The answer, the simple answer is no. Uh, we have online programs. Uh, if you go to our website, MontgomeryHeart.com, and uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to share this part of our website uh, with you. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, if you go to MontgomeryHeart.com forward slash um, journey, uh, you will be able to look at some of our online programs. So we... I have a link actually for the online program in the show notes. Okay, great. And so I'll just quickly show it and then um, you'll see the, the, the uh, online link. But, but this site talks about uh, how you can become a member of our community. And um, I'll just stop sharing real quick. But the, the online programs uh, stem from coaching programs, the online community that has support groups as a weight loss support group. Uh, there's, uh, we get fabulous speakers such as uh, Chef AJ to come and present to that community. Uh, but, but it has a, a community of people where you have support. There's also online coaching where we walk you through detox programs. Uh, many of our individuals in our coaching programs, uh, they order meal plans from us and things like that. So you don't have to be in Houston. You get all the advantage of our on-site restaurant because you know we do shipping all over the country. Uh, we do coaching all over the country. We have people in Canada who's on our coaching program. So uh, you can get a lot of the benefits of our program uh, remotely. For individuals who have advanced health problems. So for instance, we saw a young lady uh, the other day, and this is just an example of many pH patients we see you know, every week uh, who flew in from you know, out of state uh, with congestive heart failure, it was on a melanoma pump, and she needs help. Individuals in that situation have to come and spend time with us because that's when they need, those are the people who need the integrative care. I then become your cardiologist, your, your doctor that manages all of your medicine, and we integrate the nutrition all with the medicine right there. We're just uh, four miles south of the world's largest medical center. So if you need medical care urgently, emergently, we, I manage you there plus in our center so you get the full scope of what you need You know, if you have advanced illnesses. Uh, advanced illness. You, you talk about integrating nutrition. Uh, not many cardiologists do that. You know, I think about my grandfather who graduated medical school in the early 1900s and cardiology was not yet a, a discipline. So oh, wow. how did they, how did they treat people back then when they didn't have all the, you know, bypass surgery and stents and statins? I, I guess they had to use something else. Sure. You know, uh, back uh, again, my, my history's failing. I mean, it's probably earlier than the 1900s, but certainly, um, um, probably back in the 1800s, I think that natural approaches were used in, in mainstream medicine. Uh, it wasn't until, you know, you had the Rockefellers and, and these guys came in and, and started introducing chemicals uh, and they changed the, I think Carnegie was involved in changing the healthcare curriculum in medical schools. Uh, and this, I think, came about in the 1800s. I don't, don't quote me on the date, the time range, but but medicine changed drastically from, you know, they used to teach botany uh, in medical school, I, I recall, and uh, reading about. Uh, and so there was more of a, a natural approach uh, mixed in with, you know, chemical approach uh, historically more than 100 years ago. But that switched drastically. And now we've gone, you know, full swing in the other extreme where doctors, uh, there was one patient that flew in from, you know, from another city uh, to see us. And, you know, he was told he had, uh, he had an abnormal stress test, a doctor, a cardiologist he saw, told him, well, you need to have an angiogram and you may need a stent. And the cardiologist said, well, you know, 
and until we do the stint, uh, you know, don't try any lifestyle changes, you know, you know, don't try. And so he's told not to try lifestyle changes. So I, I thought that was quite, uh, quite interesting. <laughs> unfortunate, you know, in unfortunate, unfortunate way. That is something, you know, you know, the typical diet that a, a heart patient is given in the hospital, I, I, it's, it's not very healthy. <laughs> No, uh, I was rounding in the hospital today and, and one of my patients was eating eggs and sausage. Now he's one of the patients who uh, choose not to comply with our recommendations. We are able to get our dietary recommendations in the hospital uh, for, for my patients, but uh, there's some patients who are just not willing to comply with that. And, and those are ones who are in the hospital more than the others. But the hospital will feed you just standard American diet, even though it may be called heart healthy. It's not well. I guess you can call it whatever you want. So you know, everyone has a First Amendment right. But uh, they sounds call more it, like heart attack healthy. <laughs> heart attack healthy. Uh, now maybe that's. <laughs> <laughs> I think they forgot one word. Yeah, that, that's right. Heart attack healthy. You know, I, I remember a quote from Dick Gregory, the late Dick Gregory, says, you know. Uh, you know, a, a guy. I was. I heard about a guy that had a heart attack, and I thought to myself. What, what did he do to his heart? To his heart, had to jump out of his body and attack him. And so uh, we do some crazy things to our hearts. It's that our hearts jump out of our bodies and attack us. That's hilarious. Let me know when you're ready for the questions, but I just, I enjoy hearing you talk about what you do, what you're doing. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the questions I, I look forward to, let me just say something about heart and soul of a champion. Uh, let me just share something with the audience about that, just in case uh, uh, they want to ask questions about that. As I mentioned, uh, we have a number of integrated care programs, the, the, uh, the most extensive of which is Heart and Soul of a Champion. And we, we were really motivated to, to uh, do this because, as I said before, you know, we've noticed some you know, advanced, uh, we've always had advanced health issues. Uh, it's become more noticeable in the last two years, uh, even to the point where life expectancy in the United States has decreased by 2.6 years in the last uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, and it's not due to recent you know, pandemics, it's due to lifestyle. And it's clearly due to people dying from cardiovascular disease and the like, and younger people are dying. Uh, and this problem has been here for a long time. I think it's now coming to uh, a head, if you will. So heart and soul of a champion is two components as the inter integrated care component, which I described earlier, uh, individuals come to our center and it's a six, four to six week intervention. Most people do a six week intervention. We start them on a time restricted uh, diet nutrition plan uh, with detox, they get a comprehensive cardiac evaluation. We determine their fitness level. So if they're able to start walking or doing whatever and whether you're in a wheelchair or walker, we start wherever you are. And uh, we have trainers on, 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 on call. We have uh, uh, training sessions and the workout sessions are outdoors for the most part. We do some workout sessions indoors, but we emphasize outdoor workouts uh, largely because we want our, our patients in the elements, uh, fresh air, sunshine and the like. Uh, and so we will start you on that intervention immediately. We monitor your medications. You're in our facility four to five days a week, getting your sauna therapy, your evaluation, vital signs taken. Uh, you're in the gym or on the uh, running field, the heels, um, uh, about three to four times a week. Uh, and so it's a, I'll share the screen with you. There are a few uh, shots of some. Uh, we started a group where, and this is just the um, uh, session here, this showing some videos, some things that we've done, and this is some, some old conference we had. But Hard Soul of a Champion, uh, the intervention, is one where we uh, bring individuals and take you through a course over six weeks. Now, we actually have filmed the first group. We, we, we got some retired uh, uh, professional athletes. Uh, here's a fixed picture of Daryl Green, Hall of Famer from the, the Redskins and uh, three other athletes. And we put them through our program. Here's an image of us running up the heels. Uh, and they went through this first uh, uh, session uh, and this is season one of our docu-series. So we're actually filming this. So Heart and Soul of the Champion is also a docu-series that we will be releasing uh, probably by the end of this year. Uh, this October, uh, starting October 19th to 22nd, we have uh, an open house 
that will allow individuals from all over the country, if they choose to come to our facility, uh, to our facility, uh, they can uh, visit with our clinical staff and we do free consultations to talk about which one of our programs uh, could benefit them if they want to come locally or uh, do it remotely. Uh, they also have the opportunity to uh, come to a red carpet gala. Uh, and the gala, and I'll go to that section real quick, excuse me, navigating on the website here. So our red carpet gala, and uh, Chef AJ mentioned you have a link to this uh, in the uh, show notes. Uh, but our gala uh, just goes through, um, let's see here. Let me bring up our speakers here. Okay, so we have our keynote speakers. We John Sally, Dr. Kim Williams, another prominent cardiologist in the plant-based community. Uh, David Carter, Dr. Pam Popper will be there. We'll have a, a, a group of panelists uh, that is listed here that's going to answer questions for the audience. Uh, and uh, host and hosts is uh, Chef Babette. Many of you know uh, uh, individuals from the plant-based community. But this will be a... a a formal and both informal setting where you'll get lots of information, you'll learn about our program, but it's a four week uh, time period where if you come to Houston, you have the opportunity to see who we are, what we do. Uh, I'll be involved in a lot of that. Also the uh, Saturday morning after the gala, we'll have a celebrity brunch at our center. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to meet uh, these wonderful people. Uh, and interact with them uh, and uh, uh, get any questions that you may have uh, answered. So uh, this is a great uh, event and opportunity to see, uh, learn about us and, and learn about what we do and also take advantage of some of the service that we have. It sounds fabulous. Wow, you got David Carter. Yes, yes. The 300 pound vegan. Yes. Very, very nice man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And one of my favorites who actually coincidentally is on the show tomorrow, Dr. Terry Mason. Yes, Dr. Terry Mason will be there. He's doing great work up in, in the, the Chicago area. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, uh, farming business together. <laughs> yeah, he, he calls it God's pharmacy. That's right. With an F. That's right. That's right. We're going to be working together. And so we, we, we're trying to work on, because we, we um, source our produce from uh, growers, sustainably grown uh, growers and organic growers. And so trying to see if we can do some things with uh, his uh, community. There seems to be so many younger plant-based cardiologists that are, are actually even promoting olive oil now for heart health. We we don't promote olive oil. I mean, there are a number of reasons for it. And I know there's some data um, mentioned about uh, olive oil reducing LDL cholesterol. And, you know, you can show data showing changes in, in biomarkers. I guess it depends on you know, the long standing data. Uh, if you eat the healthy olive, you're getting the olive in the olive oil. So you certainly, there's no harm there. Um, I mean, there's, there's short-term data showing, you know, um, benefits of um, say the carnivore diet or, you know, the keto diet. And you have to remember that you know, a lot of these diets are beneficial when you remove certain things and removing processed foods is a very important thing. So if you look at olive oil and the studies they've shown improvement in LDL cholesterol, they may be replacing olive oil with say a more uh, a toxic oil uh, or an animal product oil. So you're going to get some benefit from the removal of uh, an agent that's more toxic. It may not be the actual benefit of that oil. Uh, so you'll have to, you know, take that into consideration. Great. Right. Well, it sounds like it's going to be a fabulous event. Yep. Yep. We look forward to it. We look forward to it. Nice. Ready for a couple of questions? That Absolutely. Have... Okay. So questions. guys, that, you know, when we have a doctor around, you got to send those questions in in advance. And we thank you for doing that. And the first one is from Jane. She says, what is the daily target for saturated fat for preventing and reversing heart disease as close to zero as possible? Or is there a point where it doesn't matter? For example, does three grams yield the same result as zero grams? Are there targets different for prevention and reversal? You know, that's a great question. It's a complex question because we always like to say, well, saturated fats are bad, so it should be zero saturated fats. 
You know, you want to think about the source of your fats always. So if you're getting fats from plant foods, then that's going to be first and foremost. That's one. Two, the plant food should not be processed. So I, I frequently don't like to think in terms of isolated nutrients, but rather think in terms of whole foods or, or foods as close to the natural state as possible. So if you consume a coconut, a coconut meat, that's going to be some saturated fat. And there's another plant, you know, uh, examples of saturated fats. But if you're consuming a whole food, a whole plant food in its natural state, then I think you're going to be in good shape. So instead of, you know, making the point of, well, you know, three grams, zero, 2.5, 3.9, it, it, it becomes very difficult to make that assessment because one, Human beings are variable in lots of ways, and the amount of saturated fat that you may need may be 3.29 versus somebody else needs 2.29. I don't know. So the point I think is the, the most important factor is the source of the fat, not so much the amount of fat that you're consuming. Now, if you're eating coconuts only all the time, all day long, then you know you're not getting a good variety of foods. So uh, I think getting a good variety of plant foods and your saturated fats are only coming from unprocessed plant foods, I think you're going to be okay. Terrific. Thank you. I'm not sure if this one if you're able to answer. If you aren't, just let us know. It's from Jean, and she says, some nutrient-rich vegan foods such as spinach, beet greens, chards, almond, cashews purportedly have excess oxalates that impaired calcium being absorbed in our bones. Can this contribute to osteoporosis? I'm not aware of any data showing that. Uh, I've heard people talk about the excess oxalates in uh, these types of foods, but I'm not aware of these foods contributing to osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is often associated with uh, hormone deficiency, estrogen deficiency in women, lack of exercise, lack of uh, sunshine and fresh air, um, um, you know, and lack of exercise, meaning uh, weight-bearing exercise. And so these deficiencies are the ones that that we see that's mostly associated with osteoporosis, but I'm not aware of any data showing that consumption of uh, the foods you listed contributing greatly or significantly to osteoporosis. Great, thank you. Okay, but a lot of times people say they can't eat foods with oxalates. Is it, well, you know, there are people who have, um, you know, a history of gouty arthritis, for example, and they're told if I eat something that oxalates, then it's problematic. You really want to look at the total balance of the diet. So if they're consuming um, um, you know, other types of foods that are causing an imbalance of the electrolytes and minerals, then, then it's really a balance of electrolytes and minerals that may predispose you to the consumption of oxalates as opposed to, well, if I eat oxalates, foods that contain oxalates, I immediately get this disorder. We try to take things and, 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 and look at them in isolation and medicine you know, teaches us to do that. Well, we found this association with this disorder. So therefore, you know, it's a cause and effect and it's not necessarily a cause and effect. I think you have to look at the totality of it. And that's why we start our patients with a cleanse to sort of get the body in biochemical physiological balance. You have to remember the body that's biochemical and physiological imbalance may have susceptibilities in that situation they would not have if it were imbalanced. And so, you know, there are many things we can't quite study and understand because A, we're looking at populations of people that are metabolic and physiological imbalance because of our lifestyles. So if you have a group of people, you give them spinach and they have, you know, they develop gaudy arthritis and see spinach causes gaudy arthritis, but then look at the other foods that they're eating that they have eaten and look at their underlying biochemical, physiological balance or imbalance. And is that really the underlying reason as opposed to the spinach? I mean, that's the same argument that people make and say, well, I can't tolerate, you know, food X, Y, or Z. Uh, because it causes my you know, indigestion and uh, whatever the case may be. But once their GI system is allowed to clean out, uh, they have adequate acid production and their microvilli is normal and so on, then they're able to tolerate these foods. Many people are not able, are not able to tolerate plant foods because they have you know, gastrointestinal inflammation and the microvilli is abnormal. So that's a, that's a biological imbalance based on the lifestyle that's put your body in a compromised state such that you're not able to tolerate foods that you should be able to tolerate. 
So it's we have to, it's more complex than oh this food is high in you know this substance and therefore you know it causes this condition. When in your medical career did you personally adopt a plant based diet and why? So I was approximately 39, 40 years old when, you know, oddly enough, and I don't remember the exact reason behind this, but I received some flyer about a, a raw vegan chef course, weekend course. And so I took the course and got a certification as a raw vegan chef. And during uh, the course, I uh, um, was exposed to lots of information about a plant-based diet and learned of a number of resources in the Houston area, one of uh, whom was a uh, person uh, named John Rose, who uh, was known to do juice feast detoxes. And so I took his course and uh, I learned a lot about plant-based nutrition, raw diet. And so I think I was maybe 39 years old, 40, and I uh, underwent the detox diet and I felt amazing. I mean, really amazing. And so, um, you know, one thing led to another. I started introducing this uh, to patients who were very, very ill, and I saw amazing outcomes. And uh, patient after patient, without exception, uh, who followed the regimen had significant turnarounds in a very short period of time. So that, you know, light bulbs went off, and, you know, the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, and at that point, when I saw these amazing changes, it's not like you. Uh, have someone, you know, go on a regular diet, or cut back on calories, they come back, they lose a few pounds, they're doing a little better. Now, these were people who were, you know, in destitute, you know, very weak hearts and wheelchair on oxygen, coming back walking and talking and laughing, you know, <laughs> without oxygen, things like that. So when I saw these uh, drastic changes in a very short period of time, short period of time being seven to 10 days, I said, I have to figure out how to introduce this in my practice. I practiced in the world's largest medical center uh, for, uh, at that time, you know, about two decades, almost two decades, now over a quarter of a century, uh, at that time for a decade, now for over a quarter of a century. And I never saw uh, the type of changes with patients, with all the advanced technology we had in, in the, the allopathic medical world that I saw would just change someone to a pure plant-based diet using raw food. And when I saw this time and again, I just had to say, well, I have to figure out how to make this happen. I had some health challenges, also taking care of my mother. These are emotional motivating factors that really you know, showed me that what we were doing in standard medicine was really insufficient. Yeah, well, good. I'm so happy <laughs> that yes. you're on our team. Okay, this question is from Karen. She says, when is CoQ10 recommended, if at all, if you're on a plant-based diet? You know, I use it in my patient with congestive heart failure. Uh, CoQ10 is ubiquinone. It enhances the mitochondrial function. Um, you know, there, there's a place for um, um, nutraceuticals, as I call them, <laughs> Nutraceuticals being either vitamins, minerals, supplements of different types uh, in a target fashion. So it's a great question. I use it in patients with certain deficiencies, especially if some advanced organ dysfunction. Uh, my heart failure patients are, are, are key people that I use it with. There's some data back in the 70s that showed uh, 600, 500 to 600 milligrams of coenzyme Q10 in patients with congestive heart failure was shown to be beneficial. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure individuals with other chronic illness can benefit from coenzyme Q10. We, uh, as we age due to um, you know, breakdown and, and abuse of our bodies, uh, suffer from mitochondrial uh, uh, deficiency. Uh, and so the mitochondria is a very important organelle in the cells and um, anything that enhances the mitochondria function would be beneficial. So things like coenzyme Q10, um, ribosome or MSM, things that enhances glutathione production, which is an intracellular antioxidant, which enhances the mitochondria function. These um, uh, nutrients and supplements can be very beneficial uh, in cellular, improve, improving cellular function and therefore improving overall. Um, physiological function, we have heart failure or any other chronic uh, ailment. Great, thank you. We've got three more questions that have been submitted in advance. 
This next one is from Julie and she says, can you please talk about waist circumference and how that factors into cardiac risk and how risky is it? Is there an, an, an analogy to help put this into perspective? Yeah, you know, you know waist circumference is probably associated with you know, adipose tissue in the midsection. It's probably associated with increased brown fat, uh, which is probably associated with increased you know, inflammation, increase uh, in the body. Uh, I, I think of waist circumference, the association of waist circumference in cardiovascular disease as an association. Um, and if you're increasing certain types of uh, uh, body fat uh, the, and around the midsection in particular, uh, it's associated with probably the fact that your body is accumulating lots of toxins. And so it's really an association. I, I don't like to think of it as a cause and effect. So uh, for example, individuals who don't have an increased waist circumference uh, can also be at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. In fact, when you look at autopsy studies um, of young children who die uh, in motor vehicle accidents from suicide, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease is around 65%. When you look at you know, uh, autopsy studies back from the Korean War of uh, male soldiers, uh, you have uh, roughly almost 80% of those male soldiers who die from traumatic injury had uh, uh, atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. And so that's average age 22. So from 16, 14 to 16 is 65% from about uh, around age 22 is about 73, 77%, 77.3%. So as you get older, it's gonna become more prevalent. So by the time you're you know, 50, 60, the prevalence, uh, I think on the standard American lifestyle is gonna be virtually universal. Uh, a well-known runner, Jim Fix, who had a very thin waistline, had, you know, died, you know, sudden death. And, you know, his waist circumference personally is a lean, mean running machine. Uh, but he had, you know, three of his major vessels had severe atherosclerosis. So I, you know, we, we, we talk about a lot of these associations and I tend not to get into these things because then people focus on, oh, what's my waist circumference? And maybe somebody gets a liposuction or something like that and you improve your waist circumference and it may be, okay, does that mean my heart disease get better as well? So I, I think there's an association, but the association is probably related to more uh, underlying common biochemical abnormalities as opposed to it, it being a cause and effect of weight circumference. Thank you for explaining that. Ah, this is an interesting question. Do you consider a high resting heart rate a cardiac risk factor? You know, um, that's a great question. And I don't think of it as a cardiac risk factor as much as I think of it as an underlying cardiac problem. So, but it's, it's, it's likely not related strictly to the cardiovascular system. So for example, uh, what's the differential diagnosis of a high resting heart rate? Well, number one could be just simply dehydration. There are many people who are dehydrated who are not consuming enough water, but also not consuming enough, you know, uh, uh, water hydrating foods. Maybe you, you drink, you know, a liter of water, but you're drinking coffee and you're consuming, you know, bagels or whatever the case is, there are foods that are dehydrating. So dehydration volume depletion is a, is a, is a contributing factor for increased heart rate uh, that in and of itself is not a cardiovascular disease, but if the heart's beating on average, 80 beats per minute, 90 beats per minute, it's going to wear out over time faster than one that's beating on average 62 beats a minute or 65 or 70. So uh, it's, I don't think it's a, yeah, I guess you could say it's a risk factor because it can wear your heart out faster, but I think it's a, a increasing heart rate. It's more a sign of an underlying biochemical or physiological, more physiological problem than biochemical but the two go hand in hand. So dehydration is one, anemia could be one, you know, thyroid disorders could be another. So there are a lot of underlying metabolic things that can cause a resting heart rate, including congestive heart failure itself. You know, congestive heart failure is associated with increased, you know, adrenaline output by the sympathetic nervous system. Well, that will increase heart rate because the body thinks it's in stress, uh, cardiogenic shock rather. Uh, and so an increasing heart rate, I think of more as an alarm uh, 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 of something underlying that's uh, that's gone awry. Thank you. 
What do you think of fat in a whole food plant-based diet if it's entirely from whole foods like olives, flax, chia, tahini, et cetera? Do you recommend staying below a certain percentage? I've heard that some of the blue zones consume up to 35% of fat in their diet. Yeah, it's a great question. And my point about fats is the source and quality. So your fat should all be raw, in my opinion. Uh, if you're eating an olive, don't, you know, boil it or whatever the case is. Seeds and all should be, you know, natural raw seeds and, and the like. In our study, when we looked at uh, individuals who had high cholesterol, a high BMI of around 30, I think the average BMI was about 35 in our study, and hypertension, we looked at this population, we put them on a raw plant-based diet and followed them over 30 days and saw reduction in cholesterol and hemoglobin A1C and the like. Uh, and the percentage fat in that was right at 20% fat in, in our study. Uh, a lot of people promote a fat of 10% or less. And so ours is twice what you know a lot of whole food plant-based doctors uh, promote. Um, the reason I point this out is that individuals are different. And so the percentage of fat may vary in terms of an individual's needs and overall well-being. Maybe someone who wants to lose weight uh, may not tolerate as much fat uh, in their diet. Uh, many they may manipulate the diet to have less fat. Uh, I've had individuals in our detox program, one in particular who comes to mind, who had lots of seizures, and we liberalized the fat. Although they were all raw, she had more seeds, and we even allowed nuts in her as not the because uh, the cashews, but like pistachios and other nuts. And she was having up to 30, 35 percent fat and had improvement. So the percentage of fat uh, I think can vary. Uh, and, but I don't think the quality of the fat should vary. So whether you have 15 or 10 or 25 or 30% fat, uh, I think that depends on what your needs are and what your potential uh, individual condition is, but the quality of the fat, in my opinion, should always remain, uh, good quality fat from whole foods that are unprocessed or minimally processed. Yeah. So, so raw in other words, and preferably unsalted as well. That's correct. Yeah, we 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 really strongly promote the raw natural fats, and and you know you don't have to add salts to if you if you're using your herbs and seasoning properly, you don't have to add salt to your diet. Some people tolerate adding salt more than others, but but by and large, you shouldn't have to add salt to your diet. Right. Coffee, alcohol, good for the heart, bad for the heart. We don't recommend coffee or alcohol. Uh, I've heard some of my colleagues talk about some data supporting it or not. Um, I think there's some data showing that uh, caffeine in the form of coffee has an adverse effect on uh, precursor cells of the endothelium. Uh, alcohol is a, a direct cardiac toxin, uh, so it's problematic, uh, as well as um, coffee, I, I, in my experience, has an adverse effect on triglycerides. And, you know, the coffee bean, I mean, it's a highly commercialized uh, crop. And so I would imagine that there's a lot of, sh you know, shortcuts. And while there may be some pristine, high quality coffees that are less harmful or not harmful, most people are exposed to the, the, the regular stuff that's, you know, um, highly, you know, uh, produced, cheaply produced and, and may not be beneficial. So my, my um, take on coffee is that we avoid it 100% when we're detoxing patients. Thank you. And did you mention alcohol? Yes, alcohol. We, we certainly avoid alcohol. At our gate, we will not have alcohol. Okay. <laughs> or, or coffee, right? <laughs> or coffee. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because Chef Bavette, who's one of your presenters, I recently had around for Longevity Week where I had vegans in their 60s, 70s, and 80s that look great, you know, and, and none of them drank coffee or alcohol. Oh, wow. The, the, well, there you go. The, who, who am I? The, these guys, they know from experience. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, you know, I, people love to know what our guests eat for a day. Like, could you take us through a typical day for Dr. Montgomery? I mean, you, you're lucky because you work at a, where there's a restaurant where you work. So yeah, a typical day. I usually uh, wake up and I'll have I, my first meal is around 10, 30 or 11. And, uh, you know, we have these, um, green waters i'll drink a green water so we call it superfood water it's a mixture of uh, a blue green algae and and um, um ginger uh, mint and cilantro uh and i'll have a straight blue green algae and then you know i'll have regular water so those are, i try to consume beverages 
uh, if I have a fruit in the morning, like late, I've been eating uh, mangoes, uh, getting some ripe organic mangoes. Uh, uh, I'll then sometimes have um, uh, a salad for breakfast or sprouted wild rice. Um, I may uh, mix a slice of avocado with a uh, sprouted wild rice, maybe another large salad. We have some gourmet raw dishes that we have as a raw pizza we make using uh, you know, like raw dehydrated breads and, and the like, and I'll have some of these, but it's a variety of things that consume mixed with grains and seeds and, and greens uh, that's mixed in different uh, formations. Nice. Yeah. Do you, so, do you do you ever use your a chef certification and then cook for yourself? <laughs> I you love know, your laugh. You have I, a great I, laugh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little out of practice. I think you know that that was a loaded question because if I answer that with some level of confidence, then somebody's going to pull up that video of me <laughs> cooking in front of you. <laughs> but I, I prepare some things from time to time. Uh, I go in the kitchen. It's more I use it more as a threat to my current chefs. You know, if they're sort of behind on production and things, they say you guys need me to come and suit out, and they sort of laugh and and uh, get busy. But but uh, I don't get the chance to get in the kitchen as much as I'd like, uh, but I do get in from time to time and uh, I work with our chefs to make some, uh, so when we're experimenting with different dishes and things, uh, I'll come in. If I have an idea, uh, then I will come in and, and do some uh, uh, quick demos for them uh, to show what I'm, what I'm thinking. That's great. Do you have time to exercise? Uh, yes, it, it, you know, it, it's an ebbs and flows. I'll, I'll have to be honest, you know, we, uh, during Heart and Soul of Champion in July, I was out, we were running heels every day. August was a down month. So, uh, September was mixed. I have a trainer I work out with. Uh, what I'm doing at my, my home, I'm rearranging things. I'm actually doing some remodeling about building and to some extent in my home. And I'm moving my gym to my garage because I want to do more workout outdoors. And I'm getting, I'm working on a, a backyard garden and fish pond. So it's a long way to answer to say, uh, yes, I do exercise. It's been spotty lately because of all the work I'm doing with the new projects. Uh, but um, I do get to the gym from time to time and I do get outdoors and work out uh, uh, from time to time. And it's, that's going to be increasing once I get my garage gym finally uh, so, suited out and ready to go. Well, I've, I've been to your house and I mean, it's spectacular. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, no, it's, it's a fun place and it's close to the office. That's the other uh, beautiful thing about it. And so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice, uh, nice environment. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we talk a lot and we have talked a lot about diet and exercise, but what about things like stress and sleep? Do they affect your heart health? Yeah, stress and sleep is important. And, you know, it's interesting because we have a lot of patients who have issues with sleep and stress. And, you know, the interesting thing about that, we're, we're seeing, you know, let's take something like magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency is fairly common. It's a fundamental, you know, uh, ion slash mineral. It's mostly intracellular and magnesium deficiency is associated with neurological problems such as anxiety, insomnia, et cetera. And individuals who are drinking coffee or doing things that have diuretics, plus our, our foods are not very, our soils are deficient in minerals such as magnesium. And uh, our foods are not mineral rich in general. So magnesium is one I'm, I'm highlighting, but you know, there are other trace minerals and the like. And the reason I point that out in the context of this question is that uh, we still find that mm. an imbalanced biological, biochemical system results in, you know, poor sleep and the like. So I'll tell someone, okay, you know, practice great sleep hygiene, you know, lights off and, you know, get rid of the the, the phone and, and so on and so forth, you know, dark room an hour before it's time to go to bed and, and so on and so forth, get away from the computer and whatnot. And they still have insomnia. Uh, and so we have to dig deeper into those areas. And one thing we saw early on was just by simply, you know, putting patients on a healthy detox diet, it, uh, one of the most uh, common reports was improved sleep. Now, it, it wasn't always enough in, in, in the case of individuals. And so we're looking deeper into other things. And so uh, like infrared sauna therapy helps out with sleep. Some of what we've seen anecdotally, uh, we'll have to do studies to validate that. Uh, this data showing that magnesium 
supplementation can help with sleep. Uh, B12 deficiencies associated with a lot of different things. Sleep can be among those things. So I, I highlight that biochemical imbalances take away from other positive habits. But you're right, sleep is very important. Uh, other things that help with sleep would be exercise, maybe having a busy active day. If your body's active, uh, being outdoors in the sun, many of us are indoors. Uh, we don't get adequate blue light during the daytime and, the dark, and we're indoors, you know, in the front of our computers, <laughs> like we're on now, uh, not getting the bright sunshine. And then at nighttime, we're indoors and it's dark and we have the same computer. So our body's, you know, circadian clock is not stimulated in the right way. Uh, and so there are a lot of little, you know, health habits like that can, that can really uh, impact uh, your other habits such as sleep. So physiological biochemical balance help with sleep uh, and stress uh, management as well. Right. And don't pets help? Aren't pets good for the heart? I think I read a study once that people that had pets to come home to fared better after a heart attack. Yeah, I've, I've, I've read about similar studies uh, and that they're there, there's the emotional part about it. Uh, some people argue that the microbiome is enhanced by having pets around. Uh, and so uh, I've read that pets can be beneficial. Yet you have none. I have none. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've had pets from time to time. My kids had, a, there was an old dog that uh, was, uh, my, my kids when they were young started, uh, uh, I think, feeding and bathing the dog and, and the dog would hang around and you know, the kids weren't always with me and I'd be out of town speaking. And so I'd have the reservoir of water for the dog. But then the dog would escape my yard and go and take the neighbor's slippers and papers and because <laughs> he was a lonely dog. But anyway. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery. And I hope everyone will check out the links if they want to take your online course. If they're not in Houston or if they're sick enough, maybe go to Houston to be treated by you and your wonderful program and go to your gala. Yes, the gala. Also, one thing I forgot to mention, you don't have to come to Houston, go to the gala. You can go on and register online. So if you want to see these wonderful speakers and see the gala live, you can register online from anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, you'll have the, uh, we will have a, a online host who will uh, you know, feed you into all the things that are happening. Uh, and you'll have a great experience even watching it online. So if you're not able to come to Houston on October 21st, uh, go to our site, uh, events.montgomeryheart.com. The link is at the bottom and you can register online if you can't come to Houston, but we certainly would love to have you come to Houston. Uh, the tickets are, are very inexpensive uh, to come and you'll have a great time. I'm glad you mentioned that because I did not know that. So I'll amend the show notes to say that they're virtual participation as well. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Dr. Montgomery. I so enjoy talking to you. All right, Chef AJ. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for another fabulous guest who actually will be appearing at Dr. Montgomery's Gala from the movie 